Great. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us online. Uh, I'm Matt Russell with the University of Minnesota uh, Department of Forest Resources. Uh, this is our Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative and University of Minnesota Extension Forestry webinar series. Um, we're really happy today to have uh, Brian Schwingle with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources uh, to give what's becoming really kind of an annual presentation that Brian does um, for resource managers across the state, um, really giving us an update about what's going on with forest health uh, what has been seen over the last year, what might we expect uh, in the upcoming year as well. Um, and so if you're online, um, uh, uh, we encourage you to submit questions online. Uh, you can send that in the chat area, which you should see in the lower right um, corner of the WebEx system. Uh, so if you type in the chat area, any question you might have for Brian, uh, we can relay those to Brian uh, as we go through the webinar um, today. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Brian, um, who will uh, talk about what's going on with forest health across the state. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for the invite as always. And as Matt said, this is, this is becoming a tradition. So I definitely feel like a broken record myself, but I hope I don't sound like a broken record to other people. Um, I try and switch it up a bit. This, this photo here is the coolest thing that I saw in 2017. And I've, I've concluded that this is caused by the, well, this is called the oak fig gall. So it's caused by a, a sinipid wasp. And I saw two samples of these last year, which is two more than I've ever seen at any other point in my life. And um, one was from the Mankato area and one was down by Houston County. So that was coolest thing I saw in 2017, and a presentation. No, just kidding. Let's see here. Uh-oh. It's not advancing. Matt will troubleshoot, hopefully. There we go. OK, so a little bit about who I'm a part of. I'm part of the, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Forest Health Group. And my counterparts in the Northwest and the Northeast are Mike Parisio and Jessica Hartshorn. And then our coordinator is Val Cervenko. And there you can see the territory and the state that we cover. So what do we do? Well, we're charged with monitoring significant defoliation and mortality events in our forests. And we do this with aerial survey. Um, and I got to thank the, the DNR has a group called the Resource Assessment Group, and they're up in Grand Rapids, and we essentially contract them to fly most of the state. Um, Jessica and Mike and I also spend a day or two in the plane. And here are our flight lines um, in orange. The U.S. Forest Service's Mark Roberts flies the, flies the northeast part, the, the lines in green. Those are our flight lines, and then all the black are areas of disturbance, either mortality or defoliation. There's a little crown dieback in there too. And this data is available at the Minnesota Geospatial Commons. So if you want to download the shapefile, you can do so there. Um, but that's just, that's the, the minor part of our job. It might take 25% of, uh, of, my, of my job to do the, to do the annual monitoring. But the, the meat and potatoes of our job is really to do um, kind of in-depth tree health investigation work for forest managers. And here's just a sampling of, of where I was at in 2017. So this is between the, the aerial survey and our, and our ground work. Um, we kind of come up with our annual report every year and this talk. Um, if you want to sign up for our newsletter and you haven't done so already, I highly encourage you to do it. Um, actually, we have a newsletter coming that should be coming out in the next two weeks. So if you Google Minnesota DNR Forest Health, you'll get to our web page and then the, the red circle on the lower right there is where you can sign up for newsletters. So we put out about four a year. Okay. In a previous similar talk, this was last and I didn't even get to it, so I'm going to put it up front. I'm just going to touch on Emerald Ash Borer. We did not do an aerial survey for Emerald Ash Borer last year. Why? It's because emerald ash borer isn't, doesn't move across the landscape very quickly and cause sudden change. So we feel like we can adequately, aerially survey it maybe once every two, every three, every four years. So 
But we get this data from Minnesota Department of Ag on the left, and then of course Wisconsin Department of Ag on the right provi provides that map. And this is just to show you where Emerald Ashport is at. Um, the red counties in Minnesota are federally quarantined. And I won't go into the quarantine. You can find out more about the quarantine at the Minnesota Department of Ag website. Here's a shot of Iowa where um, Emerald Ash Borer has been confirmed at in Iowa in the brown, the brown circles there. So Emerald Ash Borer is around. Well, what to do about it? Um, I think very important thing is to know where it is at and act accordingly. And so if people out there want to know where Minnesota or where Emerald Ash Borer is at, they should Google Minnesota Department of Agriculture Emerald Ash Borer and they'll get to the Department of Agriculture's website and on there you can get to an interactive map where you can type in your zip code and it'll tell you how far away Emerald Ash Borer has been confirmed. Um, to be prepared for Emerald Ash Borer you want to, in, in forests, um, what the Minnesota DNR is trying to do and what we're encouraging others to do is basically to promote other species which is way easier said than done. Um, Minnesota has more black ash than any other state in the country and black ash forests are, are, you can't always get into them every winter. You can only generally get into them to operate in the winter time and most of them or a lot of them are pure black ash and there's very little diversity. So it's a huge challenge. So it's easier said than done to promote a more, more diverse forest in Minnesota. Um, in terms of communities and people that own ash trees in their yard, I recommend that they formula, they, they think about which ash trees they want to keep in their yard, if any. And once Emerald Ash Borer has gotten pretty close to their home, um, maybe a couple miles, maybe a mile, um, then they could start taking action in terms of protecting the tree chemically if they choose to do that. If they choose not to protect trees now, then I recommend planting other trees other than ash trees right now and wait until Emerald Lash Borer starts infesting your ash tree and then get rid of your ash trees before they become hazard trees. Okay, so that's enough about Emerald Lash Borer. Um, I'm going to talk about two-line chestnut borer now. Two-line chestnut borer is a related species to Emerald Lash Borer, although it is native. Here's an image of what an infested red oak looks like one year after it's been, or two years after it's been infested with two-line chestnut borer. Two-line chestnut borer, um, you can see the, the immature stage on the left, the larva, and it makes these, these galleries between, well, in the inner bark, sometimes sketching or um, scratching the outside of the sapwood, and it kind of looks like etch-a-sketch galleries. And then there is actually a picture of, an, of a two-line chestnut borer in the lower right there that's there. Boy, they blend in. I can't even see it. It's in there, I swear. And when, when the adults leave, they leave, of course, they leave the infamous D-shaped exit holes. Um, the story with two-line chestnut borer in Minnesota, though, is I, I'd like to focus right there in central Minnesota. There was a really bad drought in 2000, late 2011 and 2012. Basically, the, 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 the severity of the drought in these maps is, goes from yellow least severe to red most severe and what happened in in central minnesota around um, morrison county and southern crow wing county was that in 2014 two years after that drought ended we were able to document all kinds of mortality of oaks because and they were infested with two-line chestnut borer so two-line chestnut borer took advantage of stressed oaks there wasn't, I'll, I'll toggle back and forth between the 2014 and 2015 map. You can see in terms of the red polygons that represent two-line chestnut borer, there was hardly any difference. But in 2015, there was that really bad windstorm um, west of Brainerd, indicated there in the blue polygons. Now, if we fast forward to 2017, you can see two-line chestnut borer starting to be, starting to pop up around that, that windstorm that occurred two years before. So I'll toggle that back to 2015, and there's back to 2017. So this map, all the red and the black, that, that shows where we documented mortality on oaks due to two-land chestnut borer. And then the blue is that 2015 windstorm. So in summary, um, we, the majority of the mortality from, from, the two, from the drought that ended in 2012 occurred in 2014. 
And four years after that drought ended, we, we hardly documented any additional mortality in that area from two-line chestnut borer. And then two-line chestnut borer popped up two years after the windstorm. So in terms of, I don't think I have a management slide here. I recommend if you're interested in managing oak forests, and if you are able to delay harvesting, you should do so for about four to five years after a, any kind of stress event has ended. If you can do that, a lot of the, the, the oaks that you leave in your stand because either you thin them or because they were seed trees, a lot of those are going to survive if you are able to wait that amount of time, four to five years. Okay, now on to the, the most dismal forest health story in the state at this point in time. The, larch, the eastern larch beetle, which is attacking our, our tamarack, and it has been doing so since about 2001. You can see an image of the adult bark beetle up in the upper right. You can see it's about the size of a rice, gra rice grain or smaller than an S on a Sharpie pen. Um, the image in the lower right there shows a, a, a tamarack forest about this time of year where birds have have flecked off the outer bark, revealing the bright red inner bark because they're feeding on the overwintering bark beetles. And then, of course, the image on the left is, is not uncommon in a lot, in many parts of northwestern Minnesota. So here's kind of a summary map of the areas that have been imp impacted to some degree by eastern larch beetle. The black polygons show forests where over 50% of the mature trees have, have been killed. And that sums up to 115,000 acres, which is larger than the footprint of Leech Lake. If we add up all of the forests, so the red and the black polygons that have been impacted to some degree by eastern larch beetle, it, it's about 440,000 acres. So here's an uh, area impacted by eastern larch beetle to some degree from 2001 to 2007, and this is an accumulated acreage. So right there you can see we're at about 440,000 acres. There's no indication this is slowing down. In fact, if you look at this, it appears that it's speeding up. This could be because it actually is speeding up, or it could be because the way our, when we're flying over these forests and there's so much mortality across the landscape, it gets to be pretty overwhelming. So we might just be making bigger polygons to incorporate all the mortality that we're seeing and assigning a lower severity to those forests. Okay, so what to do about eastern larch beetle? Well, to start off with, the state of Minnesota owns 80% of the land that is being affected by the larch beetle. Um, we are attempt the state of Minnesota DNR is attempting to accelerate harvest on tamarack in tamarack forests. Again, much easier said than done, and it's very similar to um, trying to prepare for the impact of emerald ash borer too, because a lot of these tamarack sites, or most, almost all of them, can only be harvested in the winter. You can't get into them every winter. Winters are becoming shorter. Um, there's not a very good market all the time for tamarack. So it's very challenging to deal with these stands, prepare them, and regenerate them so that they are not susceptible to, to eastern large beetle. Um, there's a lot of research to be done on eastern marsh beetle, even though this insect is native and it's been around forever. Um, there are lots of questions that need to be answered. The University of Minnesota um, found out that our shorter winters basically are helping this beetle to, to have two generations per year rather than one generation. Um, for the 2019 um, grant cy cycle to LCCMR, um, the DNR, University of Minnesota, and several others have, have put in a proposal to study the impacts to wildlife populations because of, the, because of eastern large beetle infestation, as well as looking at how we can accelerate regeneration and seed production. And then the University of Minnesota Department of Entomology is planning on um, submitting a uh, project to the LCCMR to elucidate the factors that help sustain or trigger an outbreak, as well as look at what natural enemies are out there that, that attack eastern larch beetle. Okay, now, 
I will, I do want to tell you that there's another insect that it, that is quite common on tamarack and it's called the large case bear and it's a little defoliating caterpillar that shows up in the early spring and so if you see yellow yellowing tamarack in the spring if you go up to them and look at their needles and see something that's similar as in the lower right kind of needle some needles that kind of look straw like maybe there's some wet webbing and floating very tiny caterpillars around um, that's because of the large case bear. Those tamaracks will be fine. They can tolerate years of large case bear defoliation. Whereas if it's large beetle, you're going to have little exit holes in the bark. Um, if you remove the bark, you're going to see these long tunnels that are the egg lane tunnels of the females that are typically vertical. So don't confuse the two. And you can see since about, again, since about 2001, we've mapped quite a bit of of case bear defoliation too. Um, here's a map in, of, two th of our survey in 2017 showing large case bear defoliation shown in orange and then the large beetle mortality shown in gray. I suspect that we, we underestimate the amount of large case bear defoliation out there because we, and when we are in areas and we are targeting um, mapping large beetle, the bark beetle, we typically fly those in later August because that's when the, the the trees start flagging so we can see where the new mortality is. But in late summer, we're going to miss any large case bear defoliation that occurs there. So we probably underestimate large case bear. Okay. None of my uh, animations are working, which is fine. I'm kind of an animation junkie for PowerPoint. Oh, well. Um, we're going to move on to forest tent caterpillar here. You can see the, the, the <laughs> pictures of the forest tent caterpillar um, on the left there. They have like these key or these keyhole type patterns on their back. Um, in a nutshell, we didn't, relatively speaking, even though this map looks like we mapped a ton of forest tent caterpillar, relatively speaking, we, we didn't map much at all. Um, the, the polygons, if you can see them in brown, that are kind of east, uh, northeast of, of Brain or, or Bemidji up there in northwestern Minnesota. That, that was pretty heavy defoliation. It was pretty, pretty impressive defoliation while you were driving around on Aspen. Um, but the trend here with forest tank caterpillar is there is no apparent trend. Um, you can see we had a spike there in 2013, but that, the severity of that defoliation was very light. So we really haven't had a, uh, a defoliation where you got to go home and, and get out the snow shovel in, in June and scoop off the, the caterpillars off your sidewalk. We haven't had that since 2003. Um, and I will also say that a healthy deciduous tree can, can tolerate at least two years of consecutive pretty heavy defoliation where they reflush. Um, aspens, for example, they can tolerate three. Now they have a growth loss when they lose their leaves in the spring and reflush. But if they're if they're relatively healthy, you aren't going to see dieback. You aren't going to see these trees die until they become defoliated for several years in a row. The Minnesota DNR has a pretty slick forest tent caterpillar fact sheet. Just doing a little advertising there. It's a, it's a good one to go to if you if you just Google again. Minnesota DNR Forest Health, you'll get to our website see, and you'll see Forest Tent Caterpillar on the left and you can download that fact sheet. Okay, on to spruce budworm. Here's an image of where we mapped spruce budworm defoliation in 2017. Basically, the darker the polygon, the more intense the, the defoliation within the, in the polygons. Um, the picture on the left shows a, a pupa of spruce budworm. And it also, and it's on a balsam fir, and it shows kind of the, the feeding pattern of spruce bugworms. They're kind of messy feeders. They don't eat all the needles on firs or spruces. Um, and, and you can actually frequently see those pupae, um, uh, maybe beginning of June, mid-June. And, and once the, the adults come out of those pupal cases, those pupal cases will, will hang, up, hang in the trees for quite some time. So I just kind of want to go over this story, particularly in, in the recent story of spruce bugworm in the arrowhead. So 
these polygons show where we mapped spruce budworm in 2012. And it had been, spruce budworm had been festering there since about 2005. And so that, that area in northern St. Louis County was defoliated from about 2005 to 2013. Now, when I go from 2012 to 2013, you can see this, those polygons show up in kind of um, central Lake County, west central Lake County. Now, just keep your eyes on that as I go to 2014, 2015, and 2016. So the redder the polygons, the more frequently the areas have been defoliated. And then there's 2017. So you can see it's kind of persisted in that west central area and then southern Lake County for since about 2013. So what to expect? Well, we can expect spruce budworm to persist in that area in southern southern lake, west central Lake County for several years, maybe until 2020, 2022. Um, so that's what to expect for spruce budworm. Just some management tidbits. Um, actually, University of Minnesota has a really good handout on um, dealing with spruce budworm. You don't want to thin during a spruce budworm outbreak in a white spruce plantation, if you can avoid it. It's best to thin before outbreaks happen. Um, and, and balsam fir, they can tolerate pretty heavy defoliation on their new growth for a couple of years in a row before their tops start to die. You can see in this picture that the top of this balsam fir is brown. Spruce budworm like to attack the upper crowns of trees first. They're attracted to light. So after three to five years of heavy consecutive defoliation on a balsam fir, that's when you're gonna start seeing mortality happen. And it's a bit, it's a little, white spruce can tolerate actually a little bit more defoliation before they start to die. Okay, on to a closely related pest, the jack pine budworm. Jack pine budworm feeds in a very similar way as, as spruce budworms, just like jack pine. Um, we've mapped Jack pine budworm in southern Cass County, northern Morrison County for the last few years. And this map shows where we mapped it in 2017. You can see the, the defoliation that we mapped in that northern Morrison County area at the, at the southern end of the map is it was all very light defoliation, meaning that not many trees within those polygons were, were impacted. And just, just from my work in that area, so pillager is in southern was that Cass County um, near Motley, northwest of Camp Ripley. That area, I'm, I'm quite positive, is not going to see any more jack pine budworm feeding beyond 2017. Um, and here's, here's an aerial image I, I photographed in flight. Um, you can see this is, this is very typical of, of jack pine stands in that area where you'll see like maybe 1% of the jack pine having, they look gray or maybe really light brown. And those trees, they either, um, they were, most of those trees actually had no defoliation on them this year and they were just dying from, from pine engraver or a, a bark beetle in the genus Ips. That bark beetle attacks stress trees. Those trees were stressed from defoliation in 2014, 2015, 2016, and now they're dying, and there's hardly any defoliation left. So the impact there is was not great. Okay, on to oak wilt, my favorite topic. Here's here's a a, a photograph I someone someone shot. I forget if that was me. Um, this is us um, landing outside of Cambridge, Minnesota on a, on a oak wilt flight we did. So these red zones are the area where I think the risk of oak wilt is substantial. The red zones are, I created those by buffering 20 miles within a confirmed oak wilt spot. So in my work in northern Wisconsin and northern Minnesota, whenever there's been an outlier confirmation of oak wilt, far from any known oak, confirmed oak wilt, the average distance to the nearest confirmed oak wilt is about 23 miles. So I can tell you that the risk of oak wilt, if you're within 20 miles of a confirmed oak wilt spot, is significant. Um, so the main message is don't prune from April through July. Um, th and you're going to avoid a lot of oak wilt infections in this zone. 
the black flecking area that that represents model um, density of red oak in the state. So you, just just to get an idea of where where the risk is from oak wood. So if if you don't move fresh firewood from a recently dead oak, you're going to avoid moving moving a lot of red oak. Every year, well, whenever I confirm an area, uh, a spot that hasn't had any um, confirmed oak wilt, and it's it's kind of an outlier, nine out of ten times it seems like it's on a lakeshore property from a, from an absentee homeowner that brought firewood up, or it's on a lake where someone brought firewood for firewood up. So that's a good way to prevent oak wilt. And here are just some messages I'd like to spread about oak wilt. Here's a point map of of confirmed oak wilt from 1987 to the present. I don't like to show this necessarily, even though I'm showing it right now. I don't know why I'm doing that, because it's misleading. the the red The red points there show where I confirmed oak wilt um, in in 2017. This map, you can see that the high density of oak wilt around the Twin Cities and the Anoka plant, sand plain. There is a ton of oak wilt in those areas. There's no doubt about that. Um, but most of those areas were were confirmed with oak wilt um, because of a, a community grant that the DNR administered from like 1987 to 2006. So those communities had funds to contribute to that grant, and so I think this this is this map is a little biased because of that. Um, also, I don't think that that people really worked on confirming where oak wilt was at in southern Minnesota for a long time. I can tell you it's much more prevalent than what this map shows in southern Minnesota. Um, I also want to say that oak wilt, even though it seems like super old news, it still has yet, well, it, it has covered about half of the red oak territory in Minnesota. If you include bur oak, it hasn't yet reached half of bur oak's range in Minnesota. Okay, so this is kind of a, it's a slowly moving non-native non -native pathogen. Um, the other thing is we're focusing our control efforts um, and outreach uh, efforts in at the edge of Oak Wilt, so in Northern Pine County and, and Morrison County. Morrison County Soil and Water Conservation District, they um, submitted a proposal to the LCCMR for controlling Oak Wilt in Central Minnesota in 2018 and 19. Um, the DNR got uh, a grant from the United States Forest Service to help control oak wilt in the state park there in East Central Pine County. Okay, on to a totally different topic. Needle and leaf diseases in our wet, wet spring. Hey everyone, happy spring. <laughs> and how appropriate that it's miserable outside. <laughs> this is character building snow is what this is. Okay, here's, here's, here's a series of maps going from left to right, central Minnesota, east central Minnesota, southeast Minnesota, showing the trend in spring precipitation. I take that to be March through May um, since about 1995. And, and the green areas represent a five-year moving average that is above average for precipitation. So you can see we've been pretty wet in our springs in central and southeast Minnesota. If you, if you go to north central and northeast Minnesota, basically since 2000, generally it has also been wet in the spring. Okay, wet conditions promote fungal pathogen, sporulation, and spread. And now I'm going to hit you up with a whirlwind of examples that we saw in 2017. And I'll start off with the most fascinating case of, of a fungal shoot infection that, that, I, that we've ever documented, I think. From an airplane, we mapped 12,000 acres of shoot blight on northern white cedar. It was... It, it was probably promoted by some kind of stress event that somehow made these these cedars susceptible to infection. Um, and it was probably some kind of opportunistic pathogen that took advantage of them. And then the moisture helped 
spread that pathogen throughout these stands. I really wish I could show you the, the image that our aerial surveyor shot out of his plane. It shows a, a wetland that's just brown. And we, we were pretty... We were pretty curious when we saw that as to what it was. So my counterpart went out into a bog and, and found that Jesus is shoot blight. Will it crop up again in 2018? Well, maybe. There's a, it seems like there's a good chance it, um, if we have a, a really wet spring. Um, but we weren't um, totally confident on the cause of this. But if this continues to occur in 2018, we will definitely collect samples and work with that with the university on getting a positive confirmation on this. It may have been a fungus in the genus called Cabotina or Sclerophoma or Fomopsis. All of these pathogens cause similar similar symptoms like this. Now, what's even more fascinating is that I noted widespread shoot blight on eastern red cedars one of my favorite trees. Eastern red cedars throughout central and, and southern Minnesota, and I recently learned that they also documented this in southern Wisconsin. And so when I took a look at, this was also shoot blight, and when I took a look at the fruiting bodies on the blighted shoots, like you can see on the right, and when I took a look at, took a look at the spores, it represented either cabotina or sclerophoma. So that was interesting. Again, if this continues to occur, we, we'll, we're going to work harder on getting a more solid confirmation working with the university. And I think what's really interesting is to take a look at these. I believe Juniperus and Thuya are in the same plant family. I think they're in the, they're in the um, cedar family, I believe. Um, and they're both susceptible to these, these same pathogens, Cabotina sclerophoma. And you got to wonder, is is our climate across Minnesota promoting these the same diseases on similar hosts? It's pretty interesting. And now I have a parallel story on pines. We noted quite a bit of needle blight on pines in 2017. Now here's an image of a Scots pine. I'm cheating a little bit here because I didn't shoot this in 2017, but it does. If you look closely, you can see these black bumps on those blighted needles. And I did confirm that was a microsphurella species on that Scots pine. But here, here's in the areas of Minnesota where we confirmed needle blight on pines. In the Arrowhead, it was on red pines. And down in Washington County, it was on ponderosa and Austrian pines. Who knew there were so many ponderosas and Austrians in Washington County? There's quite a few I learned this past year. But anyways, um, the, the images on the right show examples of, of prob the probable causal agents of the needle blight. One of those is, is Dothostroma needle blight, also called red band needle blight, I believe. And then the other one is Lophodermium. Okay. And so um, I, I looked at, at some of the spores from Washington County, and my counterpart looked at some of the spores in the arrowhead, and we both thought that what we were seeing was Dothostroma needle blight. My counterpart also thought that she also saw Lophodermium up in the arrowhead. So again, I ask the same question. Is, is what we're seeing here kind of related because of weather and similar pine species? And so hopefully we, well, hopefully we don't see this again in 2018, but if we do, we'll certainly look into it a little bit more. Here's just an image um, showing, this is Lophodermium on, boy, that looks like Scott's pine. Um, but this is just kind of when you see, I, I wanted to show you an image of when you see a lot of needle disease in the lower canopy and it's worse in the nor lower canopy, there's a pretty good bet that that's caused by a fungal need needle disease. Not always, but a pretty good bet. I just had to put this on there. I know this, this talk isn't really supposed to be about management, but I see just driving around, you see so much needle disease on conifers and people's yards throughout the state. I wanted to get this out, out there. Um, particularly, number two, get a lab confirmation because it's not always a fungal needle blight. You can, like, if, if your pH isn't right, it can make symptoms that look like a needle blight. Um, I've seen people apply lime to make their yard, their turf beautiful. And boy, does that kill Colorado blue spruce fast. 
and what and it makes them look like they have a needle blight. And they might have a needle blight, but I think the root cause there is liming your conifers. Not a great idea. Okay, moving on. Whoa. Now I'm going to talk about some fungal leaf disease on broadleaf trees. Okay. So the first disease, anthracnose. Anthracnose shows up on a wide variety of, of broadleaf trees. It deforms the leaves and it causes just kind of random brown blotches on the leaves. We got a very high number of reports of anthracnose on bur oak in June of 2017. Um, and then I looked at the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Clinic's records and they also got quite a few reports of bur oak, of anthracnose on bur oak. Now that showed up in June. That was not bur oak blight because bur oak blight basically doesn't show up in June and bur oak blight does not deform the leaves. More on baroque blight in a minute. We also got more reports of ash anthracnose. This is at least the third year, this is the third year in a row that I'm aware of, of where ash dropped their leaflets. A, a lot, I shouldn't say all ash. Some ash dropped their leaflets in, in May. We got a lot of reports in that. I know this has been occurring in Wisconsin for even longer, that my counterparts over there have been getting a lot of reports of this. From what I understand, anthracnose on ash can do this if infection occurs early. And that picture in the upper right shows classic um, leaf disease pattern indicative of a fungal leaf disease. Okay, on to the second disease. So I just talked about anthracnose, now I'm going to talk about burrow blight. It shows up in later summer and it does not deform the leaves like anthracnose. It leaves, like that picture on the right, shows very characteristic v-shaped leaf browning pattern it's very characteristic of bur oak blight on bur oaks the other thing is that if this does if the, if the pathogen that causes bur oak blight infects bur oak leaves as they're unfurling um, it it kills those leaves and those leaves tend to persist in the canopy so if you have a bur oak that has kind of scattered dead leaves in the winter time and then if you take a look at the the, their petioles, so the base of the leaf blade that attaches to the stem, and it has these black pimples that are popping out. There's a very good, that's a very good indication that that is caused by bur oak blade. So I am very curious about the impact of bur oak blade. Is it really, it looks horrible. It causes a lot of angst amongst many people, but is it that serious? We really don't know. So I'm trying to expand this network of of observational plots where in early September, a prof some natural resources professional <coughs> looks at 40 burrows in a plot and tells me what percentage of them have been defoliated, presumably by burrow blight by early September. And we found that about, we looked at about 10 plots, 420 burrows in, in all, we found about 2% of them were defoliated by early September. So not a high number. But let me tell you, when you're driving around central Minnesota and 2% of the trees are brown, it looks really bad. Um, bur oaks can tolerate many years of consecutive bur oak blight. And here's just a, a picture of a tree in Sherburne County that I photograph every fall. And last year I decided, well, I can't really assess the health of this tree in September. I have to look at it in, in early summer. So you can see that picture down there in the lower right showing that, that tree in June has no dieback, it's it's pretty healthy looking tree. Even though it sustains over 75% leaf loss every September, well, for the last three Septembers in a row. So that's just an example of how how much leaf loss trees can, can incur if they're infected or defoliated by something in the latter half of summer. Okay, the third disease I noticed quite a bit of last year, it seemed more than usual, was presumably a tubacchia leaf spot disease of red oaks. Again, this showed up in, in later summer. It, it affected the lower canopies most heavily, caused brown blotches. I didn't get a lab confirmation, but in all likelihood, that was a tubacchia leaf spot. It certainly was some kind of fungal leaf spot, I will tell you that. So in a nutshell, we don't need to worry about leaf diseases on broadleaf trees in Minnesota in the forests, at this point anyways. 
For yard trees, just two quick comments on Baroque because I hear every year people cut down their Baroques in the winter time because they think they have oak wilt or they're dying or something. And basically, Baroque blight, from, from what I've seen, if it's a healthy Baroque, there's, no one should be cutting down trees with Baroque blight at all. It's not like you're gonna stop the disease from spreading or anything like that. It's, it's known throughout the range of Baroque in Minnesota if you're adamant on treating your your baroque tree you only want to do so if it's a very healthy tree and and to minimize the use of pesticides in the world you probably should only treat that thing if it's incurred pretty heavy baroque blight for several years in a row oh, we aren't done yet with the wet wet spring fallout okay so this was fascinating heavy venturia shoot blight on Big tooth aspen, not quaking aspen, but big tooth aspen, um, and it occurred in, in the Pillsbury State Forest there in, in the southern part of Cass County, and then over in Cloquet. And what it does is it just kind of wilts, shoots, turns them black of aspens. It was what's interesting is it was noted both in Minnesota and Wisconsin heavy venturia leaf blight on big tooth aspen. It's not concerning. It's just another result, I believe most likely of our wet springs. So here's just kind of a summary of what I talked about. And now that graph on the left shows, shows the spring precipitation from 1895 to 2017. And you can see in the last couple decades, we've been wetter than average. And I think that's promoting all these fungal issues. Okay, Matt, how long do I have? Uh, we can go until about one o'clock. We do have a couple questions online coming. Let's in. take some questions. You want some questions? Sure. Would you like oak questions or eastern larch beetle questions first? Well, eastern larch beetle. Okay. Uh, so one question um, is: Has any tree regeneration survey been done uh, in stands hit by eastern larch beetle? Yes. Surveys have been done in stands hit by eastern larch beetle. Um, the DNR actually did an uh, stand regeneration assessment with airplanes because these stands are so difficult to get to um, and their results were um, statistically inconclusive but they found that about 75 percent of the stands were stocked now i'm actually not totally clear on whether they assessed only unharvested tamarack or tamarack that were just hit by the larch beetle and were left alone. But they did do some assessment, and part of the, the proposal in 2019 um, to the LCCMR is to refine our regen assessment capabilities through remote sensing. There are some case studies, too, in the native plant community world that I'm aware of looking at untreated or unharvested an unharvested part of the stand adjacent to a harvested part of the stand. And basically, tamarack is regenerating. But actually, in, in that stand, I'm not clear on whether it was infested by tamarack by eastern larch beetle. But there has been some preliminary work done to answer the question, and more, more to come. And a follow-up on eastern larch beetle. Is there any research on tamarack strains that are resistant or less attractive to eastern larch beetle? I'm not aware of any resistance work looking at tamarack in particular. My understanding, and the entomologists in the room correct me if I'm wrong, is that western larch and subalpine larch in the, that are native to the western United States are not susceptible to intense attack from the eastern larch beetle. It's not been tested. Okay, well, that's interesting. Okay, it's not been tested if those are susceptible to eastern larch beetle. Stay tuned, we're collaborating. Okay, so there's <laughs> there's some planned work. That's great. And then I also understand that some European tamarack are susceptible to attack by eastern larch beetle. Yeah, for, for eastern our larch. Eastern European. larch, yeah. we are seeing lower rates of attack on trees that have higher densities of resin pockets physiologically. Um, that's unpublished data, and we're, we're still working that out. Okay, so there's. But I, would not, I still would not call that resistant. Okay, right. So there's some variability and susceptibility to tamarack based off of resin pocket density. 
pretty exciting, unpublished. You didn't hear me say it. Okay, Oak questions? Um, yes, a couple of Oak questions. Um, going back to two-line chestnut borer, are well-managed Oak acres better able to survive and recover from two-line chestnut borer? I can't honestly, uh, I, no, I, I don't know if well-managed, well-managed is, that needs to be defined, of course, to answer that question. Um, I mean, if we're talking about a stand that is not overly dense and the trees are rigorous, I would say, yes, that stand is more resilient to attack by two-line chestnut borer than a stand where it's, the, the trees are competing with one another, so they're competing for moisture more, um, with one another, that stand in that case would be more susceptible to to losses from two-line chestnut borer. But two-line chestnut borer responds, it, it, its population responds very well to stress events. So if there's a drought, its population goes up. If there's a if there's an outbreak of gypsy moth, for example, its population goes up. And then a follow up on that. Um... Are damaged oak trees from two-line chestnut borer and maybe even oak wilt and bur oak blight, some of these other problems with oaks, are they salvageable as, salvageable as for lumber? Hmm. That's another question where I'm not totally, um, totally confident of the answer because it really has to do with, with mills and, and what products they're accepting and if a, a dead product is acceptable or not. Sometimes a dead oak is is marketable. Sometimes it's not. It depends. In it, I mean, general rule of thumb, a living tree is going to have more value than a dead tree. Yeah. That's all the questions from online. If folks still want to type in questions, feel free in the chat area, uh, and we'll relay them to Brian. Okay. Moving on to hail damage. There were quite a few hail damages or hail storms in Minnesota in the summer of 2017. Um, you can see here they're kind of scattered all over the forested part of well, the northern half of the state. Um, just zooming in there into northern Washington County, this was a 14 mile hail track that I think further east it actually spurred a tornado in Wisconsin that went a long, long ways. So in a way, we kind of lucked out. What we didn't luck out on was the impact to red pines in that hail track. What's fascinating about this area in northern Washington County is that if you look at any tree species, you can find wounds on the branches on the top side. But the only tree species, besides one red maple I saw, that actually looked like it suffered from the hail was red pine. And when you took a look at these, these just slightly injured branches of red pine, they had a lot of, well, they had cankers in them. They had black sapwood indicative of Diplodia shoot blight. And hail is, is well known for, for spurring Diplodia shoot blight in, in red pines. It may be that it triggers uh, a latent pathogen to start causing disease, or it might be because these little wounds create infection courts that the, the spores can infect and then cause shoot blight. But the shoot blight happens very quickly after the hail. And in a nutshell, if 50% of the shoots and the buds are dead on that red pine, which is way easier to say than to actually assess on a given red pine, I ju just a general recommendation is to remove those red pines in the you know, northern half of Minnesota before June 1, chip them up, get them off the property, debark them, do something with them, just don't leave them on your property. Um, in, this, in the southern half of Minnesota, in the Twin Cities, probably best to get them off of there by May 15. And the reason for that is to minimize secondary um, impacts from bark beetles that might attack those really stressed pines and then, you know, they'll mature in the heat of summer and in as much as five weeks pop out and look for the nearest stressed pine to attack. Just a note on bark beetles versus wood borers. And this is just very general. If you see sawdust coming out of little holes in pines in the early summer, and you remove, I, I recommend removing a little bit of, bit of bark and looking for these rice grained sized beetles, dark colored beetles. And if they have these nice intricate tunnels in the bark, those are bark beetles. In general, 
it doesn't hurt to remove those trees because they're probably going to die. What was really interesting is last year, a DNR forester brought me to a site where a bunch of arbor vitae and a big windrow in, in Faribault were dying, and that was because of cedar bark beetles. I recommend it just get rid of those dying trees so that those bark beetles don't come out and start attacking the adjacent conifers. Okay, the picture on the right, now if you see that, that probably means your tree is dead. You don't need to worry. In general, um, wood borers attack dead and dying, our native wood borers attack dead and dying pines or, or conifers in Minnesota. You don't need to worry. Sometimes you can hear them chewing, which is very uh, worrisome to a lot of people. Don't worry. It's no big deal. You need to worry about those bark beetles. Back to the hail. Um, I've learned that sometimes that picture on the left, it can look really bad and that pine plantation will be just fine the next year. And the picture on the right shows a, a, a red pine up at Camp Ripley that got nailed by, by hail. You can see the, you know, the western side of its crown was killed from hail. And that was in 2015. That, I shot that picture in 2017. It's still fine. It wasn't attacked by bark beetles. You can probably thank our, our, the rains that we're getting. So that was a whirlwind tour of, of some of the things that we saw in 2017. And I think I'll leave it there. I just hit in the following slides. I, I know I covered Japanese beetle and linden borers. Oh, okay. I just got to show you guys. We'll just skip over Japanese beetles. We'll just skip that part. If you're quite, if you're curious about Japanese beetles, University of Minnesota Department of Entomology has a fantastic um, web source on Japanese beetles. I think it's the, the best that I've seen out there. Go to that. I, this dying linden thing is just pretty darned interesting. See this linden? This linden in, in Mankato died. That died in, in one summer. The, the top died in one summer. It, it seems like it dies very quickly. When you go up to these trees, you'll see an array of fungi. And the wood is very rotted. And when you go up to the wood, let's see if I have this picture. There, there are bark, there are, there's woodpecker damage all over it. And then there are these, these very circular holes. And, and this is because of linden borer. Linden borer, my understanding, it's a native insect that attacks stressed lindens. Why is it attacking? Quite a, it's been attacking boulevard lindens in the city of Mankato for a few years now. And my understanding, there seemed to be an uptick in dying lindens in Minneapolis and St. Paul last year. I don't know why. It's just interesting. My recommendation, though, is if you, if you have a yard with several lindens, like my yard, or if you're a community forester, you're, you're managing boulevard trees, if you see rapidly dying lindens, cut them down and chip them up. And then you're going to be killing hundreds, if not thousands, of linden borers in that tree. That's all I had. Well, Brian, I'm not seeing any questions online. We have some from here in St. Paul. Maybe one question, Brian. You mentioned getting a lab test for some of these issues, particularly yes. some of these newer problems, the northern white cedar shoot blight. So yes, your recommendations for that in terms of where to go? Yes. If, if you want a... Uh, 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 if you see a disease, there's no insects going on, you can't identify the insects and you think it's caused by a disease, maybe you see some little black pimples on, on something or some discolored sapwood or bark, you can um, clip off a sample and I recommend overnight shipping it to the University of Minnesota Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic. They're the only clinic that I'm aware of where the, the public and the private sector can send samples for disease diagnosis and they have a whole range of tools that they can use from um, DNA sequencing to traditional uh, extraction of pathogens on the petri dishes that, that, they will, that they offer for service. So I recommend using them. And in general, you, you want to keep samples cool. So if you're harvesting, if you're, if you're collecting them in the summer, if you you know if you're out in the woods, put them in a Ziploc bag. When you get back to the office or your home, put them in the fridge. Overnight, ship them the next day down to the lab. Yes, and take pictures. Thank you. Pictures accompanying the samples are very important. 
I, I feel bad for the clinicians because they, don't, they can't see the site. And seeing the site is so important for disease diagnosis. Also seeing the pattern of disease symptoms within a tree canopy is absolutely crucial for, for disease uh, confirmation. And for example, for oaks, if you want to submit a sample for oak wilt, I know they like samples ranging from basically a quarter of an inch to a, to a half inch in diameter. And you want to submit for, oh, the other thing, great question. The other thing is that you don't want to send dead samples. You know, dead samples, probably the, I mean, there's a good chance that the pathogen that caused, that killed that tissue is long gone and now you have decay organisms in there. And so it's really important when you submit samples to the lab to send a sample that is in the act of dying. Yep. Good question. And then one final question for me. You mentioned the best time of the year to look for bur oak blight is later in the summer. What about oak wilt? Oak wilt is tricky because it can, oak wilt can show up at any point in the growing season. And it can show up and as soon as the, the oaks start, start unfurling their leaves, like in early May, late, late April, and in that case, if it was infected the previous year, it can send out these little leaves and then they'll just shrivel and die immediately. Um, in June, July, August, September, I've seen oaks die within a month, drop all their leaves. So it can, it can happen throughout the growing season. When you get into September and October, diagnosing problems on oaks becomes very challenging because Depending on when that oak was infected with oak wilt, it might not necessarily rapidly drop its leaves. A lot of the leaves might stay up in its canopy, especially if it's on sandy soil. And so telling the difference between oak wilt in early October and two-line chestnut borer becomes darn near impossible. So in those circumstances, I highly recommend submitting a lab or a sample to the lab. And for bur oak blight, I mean, you can confirm bur oak blight throughout the year. In the winter time, if you wanted to submit a sample to the lab, you could collect dead leaves that are in the canopy that have those swollen petiole bases and submit those to the lab. Um, I recommend in general just waiting till the characteristic symptoms of you know the, with the the V-shaped leaf death show up on the blades, the leaf blades in um, August, early September, late September. The the initial symptoms sometimes with Burrow plate that most people could see would be vein death. Lots of times you get the the leaf veins just dying on burrows. But again, I mean I have seen those show up I think in late late June. But typically you're, most people are going to notice burrow plate symptoms in August September. Alrighty, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming. Yeah, well thank you, Brian. Um, I know that Madison Robin just sent out a link for um, the continuing education credits if you're interested and want those. Um, we will have a recording also of this webinar um, and we'll send that out to everyone that registered uh, to watch. So that'll be coming in your inbox in a couple of days. And then I just wanted to mention our next webinar on April 17th uh, is going to be talking about tree physiology and tree responses to drought. Um, and so that will be um, Dr. Rebecca Montgomery uh, from here in the University of Minnesota Department of Forest Resources. Uh, so thanks again to Brian, uh, and we'll sign off right now.